So we'll move on there to, um, to Sean Sparling, who's going to be talking to us about uh, giving us an independent advisor's uh, view, perspective on impl IPM implementation. So Sean is a fellow of the Royal Agricultural Society and is the chairman of Europe's largest body of independent crop consultants, the AICC. Sean also runs a busy independent agronomy company in Lincolnshire, where he walks over 27,000 acres of combinable roots, uh, combinable and root crops. But he keeps his steps up to up to 10,000 10, every day then. Um, he also advises over 10,000 acres of grassland on an around five hundred acres of commercial turf and is well known in the industry for his forthright views and his passion for protecting and safeguarding the future for the UK agriculture. Walking over 15 miles of crops every day, he's known for uh, his hands-on approach and his attention to detail. So over to you, Sean. Yes, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Catherine, for that kind introduction. And of course, for asking me to present to you with my experiences um, and also those of our AICC members um, from an independent advisor's perspective. As you may or may not know, the association of the AICC and the membership of just over 280 souls collectively advising on just over 2.2 million hectares of the 4.6 million hectare arable crop and a significant proportion of grassland as well. So we are significant influences, if you like, when it comes to educating growth and indeed in driving the implementation of IPM as a vital tool. The first thing to say over this next 25 minutes or so is based upon my experiences as an advisor on just over 27,000 acres of Lincolnshire, but I'm also representing the views of the independent advice sector as a whole, which I feel comfortable doing, having spoken at great lengths to all of the agronomy groups within AICC itself and almost all of the other individual members. Bearing in mind over 92% of the membership is part of a wider group of advisors in their own areas, spanning the length and breadth of England, Scotland and Wales. And so I can speak with confidence that these opinions and observations form the views and the practices across our AICC membership. I think the best place to start is where things sit as far as grower and advisor awareness of IPM sit. It's very clear the combined efforts of the VI and the NFU and the various steering group and individuals have led us to a point where everybody's heard of IPM, where a majority of growers now fill in their own IPM plans e each year, which is different to even where it was five years ago when the agronomist on farm was left to do that on the growers' behalf. And that did very little to raise grower awareness around IPM and where, yes, we employ IPM practices on our farm is pretty much a standard response and can be taken as read. So growers and advisors know what IPM is. That's a good start. IPM, of course, is however far more wide ranging, complicated, risky and stressful than simply ticking a box or three online every 12 months in a warm office on a wet December day. It's not the solution to our problems. In fact, far from it, as we've heard. But it is a vital part of modern crop production and has been for decades in one form or another. IPM, I think, is now and always has been, whether it was called IPM, cultural, rotational, crop management practice or whatever, the basis of good agricultural practice was common sense. Growers can feel guilty for not implementing it more fully, but they will, through their and their own advisors, actions doing far more than they probably realise because it's quite apparent that a lot of the good agricultural practice that's embedded and employed on farm isn't necessarily viewed as being IPM rather as I say as common sense and the best way to carry on. The first thing many people think about when IPM's mentioned of course is insecticides hence why we're here at a pest and beneficial conference but to me as an advisor and the rest of the advice sector and wider industry IPM protocols IPM as a tool is employed across the board, herbicides, fungicides, rotation, cultivation, nutrition, soil protection, water protection, all as important as one another and all IPM government. The pests are not just little flying, biting, chewing things. 
pest is anything that poses a problem that needs dealing with. So IPM is invaluable and already endemic in UK agriculture. And it's not simply about insecticide use. It's because of those wider implementations that a common sense, good practice tool that its adoption has been much more widely accepted. We all know that without IPM practices like delaying drilling into late October on black grassland, for example, complementing the delay using stale seeper, then removing a couple of good flushes of black grass before the drill goes near the field, our herbicide, our residuals, and even products like Luximo are going to need all of those IPM cultural based help too. Without that cultural approach, we have no hope of controlling black grass with our now severely depleted contact herbicide armory. But it's not gone unnoticed with growers that since we lost the neonicotinoid cereal seed treatment, delaying that drilling, employing IPM for the black grass control has also benefited them in other ways. And obviously I'm referring to barley yellow dwarf virus incidents. I have several farms with land blocks that have always had a history of BYDV in high aphid autumn. But considering the unreliable and impotent nature of our current insecticide toolbox, self-inflicted, as we've heard, if we're honest, by our overuse over the last two or three decades, and you can't help but accept that had insecticides cost 10 quid an acre rather than 50p an acre, we possibly wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. But that delay in the drilling date to combat black grass has, even in high bird cherry oak, grain aphid, rose grain aphid incidents autumn, made a very clear impact on BYDV levels in the spring. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But IPM implementation all goes hand in hand with a simple but fundamental principle that both the grower and the advisor need to understand and accept all of the risks and the potential for it going very wrong, which it often does. But when it comes to controlling black grass, for example, stale seed beds, delaying the drill, increasing seed rate, using competitive variety, changing cultivation practices, switching rotation, and using the rotation to manage black grass between crops, and accepting that whatever gets done after the five days after the drill left the field is unlikely to do any good on that black grass, growers and advisors do all of those things without questioning them because they clearly work. It's all IPM without being questioned because it has proven results and proven benefit. The silver lining on one cloud at the moment, of course, is the cost of nitrogen um, and other nutrition through the roof and looks unlikely to get back to the 250 pound a ton heady days for ammonium nitro. But growers last year, even then thinking it was too, too expensive, how wrong they were when they said, that's too dear, I'm not paying that, I'll wait till it comes down. But because of the huge cost of nitrogen now, the later drill crops may need less nitrogen to support tighter canopy. Later drill crops have less in the way of disease, so therefore fungicide programs can be fiddled with. Instead of having to chase frothy crops loused out with disease in the lush lower canopy. But again, IPM solution, accidental perhaps, but trying to make sense of a very imprecise science. We need to use all of the tools in the toolbox, not just the bloody great big hammer, if you don't need to say. Disease control, whether rotation is used to, to, where we manage soil pests in potatoes, sugar beet, peas, beans, rapes, cereal, all IPM in action and all routinely used. But with diseases, we do still for the time being at least have the backup of some cutting edge fungicide technology to control and limit the effects of disease. But again, ingrained IPM protocols from varietal diversity, Greenbridge, Brownbridge management, stubble hygiene, all complementary and routine IPM practice. So to come back to insecticide use, IPM I think needs to be more fully implemented in the wider advice sector, particularly when it comes to insect control and our impact upon non-target species predators and beneficiaries. When the constraints and joys of a litigious society prey very heavily and weigh heavily on the shoulders of the advisor and the land manager making those decisions to spray or not to spray, that's the question. But to illustrate the problem, I think a more relevant part of that particular Hamlet soliloquy here is the conscience makes cowards of us all. And it's very difficult when you feel you're on your own to make mistake by trying to do what's right with nobody to back you up <clears throat> with any sort of compensation or acceptance. But that's what we're trying to achieve. So in my daily life as an independent crop consultant, and this goes for almost everyone I've spoken to within the AICC membership, every season, I will make considerably more decisions not to apply an insecticide than I do to use them. 
every one of my growers is made fully aware of the risks of not spraying for BYDV vectors, brookid beetle, pollen beetle, seed weevil, podmidge, BAC, P and bean weevil, PMOP, the list goes on and on. But we will agree between us that I will get on my hands and knees and I will actively look for the pest. I'll constantly monitor threshold incidence and progression and that I will never leave an, a recommendation for tech site unless thresholds are met or exceeded and unless predators are not present either. And predator ID is equally, if not more important than pest identification. I won't leave an insecticide wreck on field just to cover my back. That's the position of my membership within the AICC too. And that's why I firmly believe that our pest problems are decreasing on my farm. And it's down to the minimal impact we're having on the beneficial and the predator population. That's not to say, however, that I don't use insecticide. There are many situations where my intervention is not just useful, it's crucial. Cabbage stem flea beetle and sugar beet yellow virus control, for example, can't be controlled reliably without every tool in the toolbox being implemented. We're very fortunate to have so many decision-making tools at our fingertips, AHDB and Syngenta in particular with the pollen beetle forecasting tool, Brookid Cast, BYDV Assist, allow us to manage our time and our decision from an IPM based aspect. But like all decision-making tools, they rely upon the user to make the final decision with the BYDV Assist tool, for example, which I use throughout the autumn and winter I know when that 170 grown day degrees has been achieved, therefore, when the risk to the crop is such, I may need to intervene. But that's where nerves of steel come in, because intervention should, as we all know, be made when aphids are easily found in the crop, 10% of plants affected. Therein lies the rub, because it's at the point of that app telling me I need to consider an insecticide spray that the decision not to spray comes in. And that's where IPM adoption is so crucial, and that's where the grower and advisor need to understand and share responsibility. When I spend hours on my hands and knees not finding aphids apart from the odd one, and therefore don't leave a grower an aphid control recommendation with largely impotent pyrethroids, largely because I'm seeing literally tens of thousands of money spiders in my wheat, the density between 50 and 600 a square metre, outnumbering any aphids by at least 100 to 1, and who amongst themselves are more than capable of dealing with that aphid threat for me, while the less engaged neighbouring farmer or agronomist may take that app notification as a green light to cover themselves by getting an insecticide on, because the app said yes. My best advice to grow is that if you're advised to apply an insecticide in any crop at any stage of the season, just ask the person who's advising it to take you to the field and show you that it's necessary. You may find it's quite an interesting exercise. But as I say, not finding the pest doesn't mean they're not there. But if I can find more beneficials and predators than I can aphid or their prey, then I'm happy to let them do the job for me. And a minority of my winter cereal fields received an insecticide last autumn for that reason. But only time's going to tell whether that was the right decision. So as always, I await the spring with bated breath and hope I got it right. It seems to have worked OK for the last 28 years. But what I do know, however, off the back of that decision is that those predators will have been happily munching away on the aphids for the last couple of months. Had I applied a pyrethroid, there would have been minimal control of the, the aphid pest because of the resistant population in the population which I would have made worse. But also the potential devastation of the beneficials and the predators in that failed population. It would actually help me and other advisors, therefore, if we had a decision making tool which was based upon forecasting the numbers and movements of predators and beneficials or apps and algorithms based upon migration and instance of predators in certain areas. If we have tools which plotted the buildup of beneficials and the prey, easier decisions would be able to be made and a reason not to spray would become more tangible and evidential. The exception crop, of course, when it comes to almost inevitable insecticide use is sugar beet, of which I oversee just over 4,000 acres. With no neonicotinoid seed treatment to fall back on, we saw two complete opposites in virus levels, uh, virus yellows levels in beet, in the first year, 2019, and the second year, 2020, without neonic. In 2019, the first year without neonicotinoid seed treatment, 
with an aphid incidence of 1.8% in the national crop, following what was a very hard cold winter of 2018 into 19. It resulted in high aphid mortality. We saw very little virus in the crop. The first wingless misus nymphs appeared in my fields around Lincoln no earlier than about the 10th of June. Predator levels of ladybirds, hoverflies, lacewings, very high. Help me, help me keep ahead of it. Sugar beet hit 12 leaves by mid June. So most fields remained unsprayed and were barely affected by virus. 2020 harvest was a very different picture. Very mild wet winter going from 19 into 20. Temperatures remained high, very few frost, even as low as zero. So the aphid population flourished and incidence in beet went from 1.8% in the 2019 crop to over 38% in the 2020 crop. That was the national average. And it was considerably higher than that on the Heath and the Fens in Lincolnshire, I can assure you. But despite the available widely implemented use of multiple applications of insecticides like Topeki, Biscaya, Insi, we saw the worst beet yellows complex virus since the 1970s. In fact, I, since it had only been bad or worse three times since 1965, in 1974, 75 and 90. But what it showed us all was that our foliar insecticide applications may well have been giving us 99% control of the aphid vector the misers persky in the crop, but with so many aphids present that year, the remaining 1% was higher than the initial threshold required for treatment in the first place. So it was a pretty futile task to try and stop them as the remaining population was always ahead of us. What we did see in 2020 was that virus yellows field treated once. Uh, the virus in those fields was no greater than it was in field treated twice or three times. Again, an indication that the collateral damage caused to predators? I don't know, but once such a high value crops in the ground, the criteria for derogation being implemented wasn't reached. We have to really question the point of multiple insecticides or growing the crop in the first place based on our current armory. There needs to be a get out clause not to grow sugar beet if the circumstances are gonna lead us into similar seasons to 2020. IPM therefore once again becomes more important than ever in beet because without a cold winter, there's very little to fall back on. If thy right eye offends thee, pluck it out and all that. I personally delved into the world of catching and releasing jars full of ladybirds I was finding into my fields at strategic points. Very unscientific, but I'm absolutely certain that this is something that we should be looking into far more fully than we are. Winter 2020 into 21 was cold. We have severe frost. And therefore the IPM driven decisions were made, virus risk was going to be very low to the national crop and therefore it didn't trigger that derogation for the neonic seed dressing. And judging by the crop out there, that was absolutely bang on. So we can trust IPM risk tools when it comes to sugar beet. If they say there's no risk, we can trust that. The BBRO said in March 21, that wind aphids wouldn't migrate into crops before the end of May and they were absolutely correct. We saw no nymphs before around the 10th, 15th of June once again and they said the risk of virus was low and they were absolutely right about that as well. So where the risk is assessed I understand is less than 7% by the way, it's not economically viable to even treat the seed, it costs more to treat sugar beet seed than it actually saves. So as we head through the next five weeks it's going to be vital that we pray for freezing cold weather and we therefore place the hand of the crop in the hands of IPM, based upon the BBRO criteria of low temperature over the period, which I'm told works out around 4.4 degrees Celsius average for January and February. Currently it sits around 5.6. We shall see. But it has to be the best way to decide these things, science and IPM working hand in hand. <clears throat> so pest control, and in particular insect pest control, is already pretty much IPM driven across the farm landscape. I haven't sprayed for pollen beetle, for example, for over 20 years. I haven't seen threshold before yellow bud, at which time obviously pollen beetle become pollinated, as we know. We've known for years that ulcid rate produces 60% or more buds than ever turn into flowers. So we know why we have threshold and we know we have flexibility. But this past season, I saw higher pollen beetle numbers than I've seen in two decades. In a crop of all seed rate on Lincoln Heath, 
which had very few other rape fields around it to dilute the numbers because of the devastating incidents of cabbage stem flea beetle in autumn 2019 and spring 2020, which saw most, if not all, crops in that area ripped out owing to overwhelming larval infestation and therefore growers didn't plant it again in the autumn of 21. The grower himself has some tau fluvalinate and he decided off his own back with my guidance and overseeing the plan to do a trial in that field, to apply tau fluvalinate because of its kind of profile on beneficial to the field at the green to yellow bud fade stage with pollen beetle in there over 300 per plant on a 50 plant per square meter population. So we should have been looking about 18 pollen beetle as threshold. I've never seen numbers like that. So I got him to treat three tram lines in the middle of the field. It's a 16 acre field. We didn't treat the headlands and the crop appeared to have been absolutely decimated. It never really reached that vibrant yellow of full flower in, in any of the field. But the crop averaged 3.98 tonnes per hectare and there was no difference on the yield map from the combine between the treated and the untreated areas. So proof, if you need proof, that actually the thresholds do work and they do mean something. In spring beans, of which I looked after a couple of thousand acres, rooted beetles become quite an issue up here over the last few years. The biggest problem being many growers going for bonuses by getting it away for human consumption. But those little holes on more than about 4% of the sample mean the majority are destined for animal feed. Spring and winter beans have so few options for weed pests and disease control that they're reliant more so on IPM based strategies in order to come close to success. Pea and bean weevil adult feeding can look dramatic, but it's rarely terminal, often looks worse than it is. So again, nerves of steel and a drop of rain at the right stage usually solve the problem. But with the crop starting to flower so quickly, if conditions are right, with crops still in full flower when the first pods are set in, the timing of any application of, of insecticide for brood kit is very complicated, to say the least. With that in mind, with four of my growers, we decided to let the predators do the job for us. We employed a 100% non-insecticide intervention approach knowing that last season we had 11% broken in the worst fields, but that where we'd applied a targeted pyrethroid to control them, we still ended up with over 6% and the beans hadn't made human consumption anyway. So therefore we decided not to spray half and we would treat the other half as per threshold or where exceeded in particular. At harvest there was no difference in broken damage levels between treated and non treated, slightly higher on the untreated. But the sticky traps and water traps in the field, there were markedly fewer parasitic wasps and other beneficial insects in those treated fields. The biggest difference was yield actually, where the untreated actually out-treated the treated. So these trials are being extended as trials next year, but the effect that insecticides having on other insects in the canopy where applied, clearly visible, not just in beans, but we know in all seed rape, 80% of the insect population will be beneficial. So by not applying insecticide to beans and all seed rape at key timings such as green and yellow bud and beyond into flowering, we protect a lot of predators and other insect life, which are likely to be at crucial stages in their own life cycles, such as Tercelocus microgaster, who prey on the cabbage stem flea beetle larvae in the crop. Microtonus brassicae, excuse me, which predates on the abbey cabbage stem flea beetle in the autumn. Insecticides, they're not discriminatory in the main as we know, and recreational cynical applications cannot and must not happen. Insecticides should be used when all else fails and when no other option exists. That's how we do use them in the independent sector. And in the main, that's how they're used in the general advice sector. But there needs to be a bloody good reason for me to recommend an insecticide. I have, as I said, been seeing marked incidents of predator impacts and uh, beneficial populations increasing where we minimise the use. And it's the same for diseases, weeds, insects. It's not, it's not what's there, it's what's not there. A few wild oats scattered in a field doesn't justify spending 10 quid an acre when an hour's roguing would tidy them up. A bit of late rust in the bottom of a crop in June doesn't justify another fungicide. So Similarly, a few aphids in the presence of thousands of money spiders doesn't warrant an insecticide. Clean fields probably mean you've spent money you didn't need to spend. And having an advisor who's prepared to spend a few hours roguing a few thistles or wild oats, <coughs> rather than wasting money spraying whole fields for imaginary weeds, pests and diseases, just to avoid a bit of criticism, is crucial. 
more so now than ever. So it's interesting to me that since we lost Bob Perifos six years ago, wheat ball fly, which was endemic and considered uncontrollable without it, it's now rarely a real issue. Nothing we can do about bull fly, of course, other than an IBM approach with we can roll them, we can make them till or apply early nitrogen, etc. But that's about it. In cereals as well, orange wheat blossom mitch instance and frequency seems to have reduced, possibly due to the increasing tolerance of resistant varieties, but also due to fewer insecticides being applied to cereals through the summer months, which is leading to more predator survival and subsequent increases in the orange wheat blossom midge predator family. If only we could truly control cabbage stem flea beetle with IPM. But the methods, urban myths and results of all sorts of weird and wonderful additional crops and approaches are invari as variable as one another and as unreliable. And that brings me back to the beginning because IPM is a state of mind. It's something you have to be all in with as a grower and as an advisor. It's no good making all the noises about how dedicated we are to IPM practice in the main and then cave in and do the opposite because you haven't got the nerve to trust your gut. We all need to understand the, the problems associated with not spraying, but also the benefits may well outweigh outweigh the risk. We all need to understand IPM so we can accept the reasons why, accept the probability and the possible consequences of not using IPM and the benefits of the whole IPM, ICM, IFM approach to the entire rotation. Now more so than ever, we need IPM to work and the tools it brings to the table become the norm. And the only way IPM will work is if it's given the chance to do so. And if we all try and implement it, Actions speak louder than words. So, so as an independent advisor with 280 other independents behind me thinking along the same line, we're well ahead of the thinking in the independent sector. I'm confident plant breeding technology such as CRISPR and the science of traits in crops will only complement and enhance the security of our future reliance, whether enforced or voluntary, upon IPM uh, strategies. Out at the pointy end in the field, the industry built on trust. The grower has to trust the advice they're being given and they need to accept it as the best advice they can get. The advisor has to trust themselves and in their competence and ability to do their job properly and with a conscience. IPM's working pretty well where it's allowed to do so in some situations, but it's worth remembering that digital support tools and apps don't make decisions. Advisors and growers carry that responsibility. So. IPM is most certainly an important part of my daily life and future farming, as it always has been, since before it was called IPM and it was just common sense and good agricultural practice. But the acceptance that IPM alone is in no way a substitute for other tools will be crucial from a future policy point of view. That's the important thing here. As an advisor, IPM is a key decision-making tool but we also have other reliable tools available to us as well. Plant protection products, seed treatments, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, biopesticides, molluscicides, etc. We're very fortunate as a nation to have the means to be better. 80% plus self-sufficiency in food, easily achievable. We have a vibrant advice sector which takes its responsibilities to the environment very seriously and which can be trusted to implement IPM and deliver it and do their jobs with a conscience. As a nation, we have a wide range of production techniques, but the 441,000 hectares of organic production, just 66,000 hectares of that is arable, 1.4% of the total, the rest being grassland. So 98.6% of crop production in the UK requires tools other than IPM and cultural to ensure its future output. IPM is a key part of that production system, but on its own, it's not close to being the answer. So disciplined, conscientious, knowledgeable advisors, along with similarly minded growers, will carry the responsibility of feeding our growing population. But there are many risks associated with a reliance upon IPM decisions for growers and advisors alike. And the full weight and consequences of those decisions, if they go wrong, should not lie solely with those producers and advisors. It needs to be more supported uh, in our industry. There needs to be more acceptance from policymakers that IPM comes at a price in more ways than one. So in summary, IPM does work in certain situations. It is a vital part of every decision I make and everything I do. It's not on its own capable of doing the job that all the other tools bring with them. 
So that's a, just like the rest of farming, really. IPM is a vital part of what we do, but it's not standalone. But I do think it's far more widely implemented than perhaps we all appreciate. So that's it. I'm starting to annoy myself now. So I'm going to hand back to Catherine. I will, of course, be on the panel for any questions in uh, an hour or so's time. Thank you.